broadcast live on Charter Communications, Cable TV Channel 8, and AT&T UVerse Channel 99, and is being recorded to be rebroadcast on the following Wednesday at 8 a.m. and on Saturday following the first rebroadcast at 1 p.m. on Channel 71 and Comcast Channel 25. Meetings can also be viewed from the city's website, um, www.cityofcapitola.org. And our technician tonight is Brian, not to be confused with staff Brian. <laughs> um, as a reminder, please turn off your cell phones um, during the meeting. And as we progress, if you come up to speak, please sign your name um, on the podium to con and confirm spelling for the record if you wish. Um, I see there's a lot of interest in the application this evening, and I ask that during the public comment period, everyone maintain common courtesy, listen to the speaker, and refrain from applause or reactions. Okay, um, so to the agenda, we are um, to the Pledge of Allegiance. Roll call first. Oh, roll call. I'm sorry. Thank you. Roll call. <laughs> it's my first time. Commissioner Esty? Present. Commissioner Jensen? Present. Commissioner Wolf? Here. And Vice Chair Christensen? Here. Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation. So on to item two, um, any new business? No new business. This okay, evening. great. Item three, oral communications. Any oral communications? Commission? Um, additions or deletions to the agenda? Yeah, just of note, we had uh, four written comments for our public hearing item this evening, and those were included in the supplemental packet. They're at the dais there for the commissioners, and they're at the back table for the public. Thanks. Thank you. Um, uh, public comments, uh, short communications from, this is the time for <laughs> short communications from the public concerning matters not on the agenda. All speakers are requested to print their name in the sign-in sheet located at the podium so their name may be accurately recorded in the minutes. Members of the public may speak for up to three minutes unless otherwise specified by the chair. Individuals may not speak more than once during oral communications. All speakers must address the entire legislative body and will not be permitted to engage in dialogue. Is there any public comment? No, okay. Um, commission comments? No, no. Staff comments. Good evening, um, Vice Chair and Planning Commissioners. Um, I just wanted to remind you a, an invite went out for the training, for Commissioner training for next Tuesday the 31st. It'll be via Zoom at 5 p.m. A good opportunity for just learning the protocols for how the meetings are run. And um, also I wanted to bring to your attention the liquid amber tree out in front of City Hall. We've unfortunately had to put a removal notice on it. It is, um, it's become pretty treacherous with people walking on our pathway and it continues to lift up not only the pathway but it's also affecting our foundation under the police station. So we're making a hard decision and um, moving forward with removal and I just wanted to bring it to your attention that it's it's now been noticed for the 10 day period and if it's not appealed, we'll be moving forward with hiring a tree company to remove that. And then at the end of tonight's meeting, I will give a director's report. I'd like to give you an update on the storm and the efforts by the city. Thank you. Um, that brings us to the consent calendar, item four. Um, all matters listed under the consent calendar are considered by the complaint by the Planning Commission to be routine and will be enacted by one motion in the form listed below. There will be no separate discussion on these items prior to the time the Planning Commission votes on the action unless the members of the public or the Planning Commission request specific times 
or to be discussed for the separate review. Items pulled for separate discussion will be considered in the order listed on the agenda. Item A is 517 Oak Drive. It's a variance for the required parking dimensions to be to construct a first story additions without meeting current parking standards. There's a request for a continuance to February 2nd, 2023. Is that correct? Um, do we have a motion? I move the consent calendar. I'll second. Okay, we have a second. Do we have a roll call? Commissioner Esty? Aye. Commissioner Jensen? Aye. Commissioner Wilk? Aye. Vice Chair Christensen? Aye. Motion passes 4 0 with um, Chair um, Westman absent. Okay. Um, that brings us to our public hearing. Um, item five public hearings are intended to provide an opportunity for public discussion of each item as a public hearing. The following procedure is as follows. Staff presentation, planning commission questions, public comment, planning commission deliberation and decision. Um, the first item is 4401 and 4525 Capitola Road. Um, this is a design permit, conditional use permit, density bonus and coastal development permit request for a 36 unit, 100% affordable housing project on an approximate 0.81 acre site in the northeast corner of Capitola Road and 44th Avenue. Staff report, please. Yeah, thank you, Vice Chair Christensen, and good evening, commissioners. Um, I'm gonna be summarizing the staff report. We've got a slideshow for you. A uh, couple of things just off the top. Uh, this is a little bit more in depth than our typical slideshow, so I'm gonna try to keep the pace up. I'm gonna talk a little bit faster than usual, but by uh, all means, if you have any questions, please slow me down or stop me. Uh, and I wanted to also make an announcement that uh, Layla from the city attorney's office is present. Uh, because of the density and bonus aspect of the project, uh, we did uh, seek a lot of input from the city attorney's office, and uh, Layla was also key uh, in, in helping us uh, do edits to the staff report, and oftentimes when we issue staff reports, we'll follow up with commissioners. Uh, for this project specifically, we held um, little mini workshops uh, compliant with the Brown Act, of course, but uh, Layla was also instrumental in that. Um, so with that, I can get into the formal presentation. Uh, we've got an aerial photo here uh, of the project site. This is at the corner of 45th, uh, sorry, 44th and Capitola Road at the terminus of 45th. Okay, so uh, don't need to be redundant, but the, uh, the project does have a design permit, a conditional use permit, coastal development permit, and uh, density bonus through state law. It's in the mixed use neighborhood zone and uh, the combination of the two sites here is 0.81 acres. A little bit of background on the site specifically, uh, really hasn't been touched or redeveloped since 1985 when the existing office buildings were built. Uh, there was a, a phase two concept with two additional buildings, but that was never uh, constructed. Uh, the big picture overview of what you're reviewing tonight is a full demolition of existing parking facilities and all buildings on the site for regrading. Um, there's two primary buildings uh, with the proposed project. Uh, the tenant portions thereof are three story, total of 36 units, and it's 100% affordable. Um, there are two parking lots being proposed, each with their own ingress, egress off of different streets. And then as I mentioned, the lots would uh, be required to be merged. A little bit of real, real world context here. I've got some street views just circling, uh, going top to bottom counterclockwise around the site. So we're at 45th <coughs> Capitola Road intersection in the top view, 
44th and Capitola Road on the middle view, and then 44th Avenue, I'll just point out, this is for zoning purposes and development standards, we take the narrowest frontage. So this is technically the front for planning purposes. Um, gonna give you a little bit of an overhead of the proposal. This is sort of a tour of uh, what is being proposed. So I mentioned, I'll start with the vehicular access. I mentioned two parking lots, so at the north, side of, um, of the property along 44th. There's a proposal for a two-way ingress, egress, and 15 parking stalls. And then uh, over at the intersection of 45th and Capitola Road, there's 21 parking stalls in this parking lot proposed. Uh, this is what's called Building A th throughout the plans. It's got 24 units. Uh, and then this red and blue and gray is some uh, amenity spaces and community spaces. I have a floor plan view of that. I can get into some little more detail. And then this is what's referred to as building B. This is uh, got 12 units in it, and in both of these uh, in the tan are three stories tall. At the core here, there's a, a tot lot in a community courtyard, and then uh, toward the rear is a trash facility. Uh, in total, buildings are about 32,475 square feet, uh, 36 units, 36 parking spaces, uh, a couple of EV chargers, and quite a bit of bike parking. So looking at, uh, this is building A's floor plan, uh, just kind of the unit breakdown there within. Uh, this is a three-story stack, so all floors are basically the same. We've got two, uh, two two-bedroom units, two three-bedroom units, and then four single-bedroom uh, units in the core. This is the, to the east, the public space. Uh, so this is a long-term bike shelter uh, for 36 bikes. We've got community laundry, a community room with a kitchen, restroom, and then the blue is management and uh, leasing and facilities uh, offices. This is building B, uh, same layout in that it stacks, but uh, only four units per floor, uh, one, one bedroom, one two bedroom, and two three bedrooms. And this is the, the primary elevation, so I, I, using this one just to kind of go over some of the architecture and use some materials and colors, uh, this would be facing Capitola Road. Uh, so we've got uh, six and 12 gable roofs, uh, up along the roof line. We've got six different massing breaks along this elevation. Uh, you can see the single story element is the community building. There's a use of uh, composite rail and uh, cement board um, or cement paneling framing around some of the window pop outs. And the siding is primarily a mix of cement board with a couple of different colors and stucco with a couple of different colors. Um, the city did send this out for uh, third-party review, uh, we used RRM uh, as a peer review architect. Uh, so they reviewed it twice they, and they understood that it was an affordable housing project, but uh, the applicant um, did improve the, the proposal quite a bit and did actually uh, take most of their comments into consideration with their second submittal. This is uh, all four sides, this was a little easier to fit on a slide, but all four sides of building B really new to add here other than you can see um, cement board versus stucco on uh, some of the other building facades as it wraps around. This is a materials board, so uh, upper left, these are the two stucco colors for the primary building facades, and then on the upper right, this is the uh, use of uh, the, la the two different colors of cement lap siding. Uh, the center one here, this is a for window pop-outs, this is a cement panel for um, framing window pop-outs on the second and third floor. And then um, just some other things, I won't go into all of these, composition shingle roof, a storefront at the community space, and then uh, some of the railing. At the uh, private patio decks, it would be composite railing. And so this is uh, kind of the A1 rendering, uh, this would be the the intersection of 45th and Capitola Road. This gives you a three-dimensional look at the entire project. Uh, landscaping is projected out as uh, being several years mature in this picture, but uh, this is the overall look at the project in 3D. And 
And then this is a view uh, from the north side parking lot that uh, takes access to 44th Avenue. Uh, seeing some of the interior of the property with the tot lot, uh, trash enclosure, and a single story uh, community space uh, through the convergence of the two buildings here. Uh, landscape plan, uh, so the applicant is proposing uh, 26 trees. Um, they've demonstrated a 40% canopy at maturity. The city standard is 15%, so they're uh, asserting that their proposed trees would exceed that standard. And also on the landscape plan, they uh, ran calculations compliant with both state law and SoCal Creek Water District to show that their uh, proposed plants were low water use and could meet the, uh, the water allowance maximum for the property. A little more detail on just the interior facing community spaces. This is showing some of the, both the fixed and movable furniture that would be included in, uh, in this courtyard space. And um, I think all eight of the units, uh, all but eight of the units have a private patio deck. So uh, eight of the singles uh, do not have a private patio. So they would be relying on this space as their outdoor amenity space. Uh, just a highlight of sustainability features. Um, at day one, there would be two hardwired EV chargers. There would be conduit laid and capped for 13 EV ready parking spaces. Uh, the applicant has shared with us that uh, through one of their funding sources, there's a requirement for solar panels. So that would be part of the project. I mentioned low water use and then uh, stormwater retention system. So, um, this is based on a 95th percentile storm event. So basically that's a, a, a one hour event uh, that would accumulate 2.1 inches of rain over the site. And so the, um, the storm water uh, retention swales that are built into this project could absorb that um, type of rain event and hold all water on site before it metered out to the storm sewer. Uh, so shifting gears a little bit, the other aspect of this project uh, is the fact that the, the applicant is uh, an affordable housing developer uh, and they're invoking density bonus, uh, concessions and waivers, uh, which impact our ability to analyze the project and uh, apply our local zoning and development standards. Uh, so some history there, uh, density bonus law is actually 44 years old. Uh, in its original form, it was uh, more or less just an offset type of incentive to uh, offset developers that incorporated some percentage of affordable housing. Um, more recently and over the years, legislature has gotten quite a bit more aggressive with uh, arming developers with these tools that they can um, bypass local requirements. And specifically, uh, I'll say in the last two to three years, there have been some, some very specific amendments to this law and um, height and parking are seen as as primary barriers to production of affordable housing. Uh, and that is acknowledged in the, the government code sections I attached to the staff report. Uh, as well, local agencies used to be able to require uh, some level of proof uh, that if a developer proposed concessions or waivers, they would need to prove that these made the project more feasible or uh, less costly. And now uh, the shoe is basically on the other foot. Um, cities would be required to make substantial findings um, that the proposed concessions or waivers uh, did not have a significant impact on costs. So we basically have to take these at face value. Um, this project specifically is 100% affordable. It qualifies for four concessions uh, and unlimited waivers. Uh, in defining what a concession is and what a waiver is. There's, there's certainly a little bit of overlap. They both have to do with relaxing or uh, bypassing development standards, but a concession is, is, is the stronger of the two tools because it actually could allow a modification of the zoning code. So again, if we were looking at a market rate type of project, we'd be looking at variances and potentially code amendments, but we are um, not permitted to do that per state law with uh, the proposed concessions and waivers associated with this project. Um, our role really, rather than requiring across the board compliance uh, with variance, or, or sorry, with zoning standards and development standards is really to assess if the project, is the project eligible uh, and does it comply with the state law? 
So specifically, uh, the four concessions the applicant is proposing, the, the top two are, are directly related. Uh, the, one is a setback reduction at the, along the north property line for building B, uh, proposing a five foot setback where 11 feet 10 inches would be the typical standard. And the way our daylight plane standard works, it would take that point, uh, 11 foot 10 inches from the property line, it would go vertical 25 feet angling into the property at a 45 degree angle. Um, if you can't envision that, it basically means a top floor setback. Um, and so that's, uh, there's two units that project into that upper floor, what would have been a setback if this was a market rate type of project. The other two are related to parking. So the applicant is proposing a one-to-one -one parking ratio where the city's current code would require two and a half parking spaces per unit and the mix of parking uh, compact, rate, compact spaces to standard size spaces, uh, applicant is also asking for 42% where 30% is the maximum. With regard to waivers, uh, building height, uh, 36 feet where 27 feet is the standard. Uh, just a, one comment on this is that the building is, is naturally, if it was, uh, if we were looking at just a parapet and a flat roof type of building, uh, the building could top out at about 30 or 31 feet. Uh, the, the last five or six feet really has to do with the roof line architecture. Uh, the replacement tree size, so typically we're looking for 24 inch box size trees. Uh, on the landscape plan, the applicant is not committing to a specific size, but uh, a few slides ago I noted that they are demonstrating compliance with the canopy at maturity. And then entry design, um, in our objective standards for multi-family uh, projects, we typically want the entries of the individual units to face the sidewalk and engage the street. Uh, the applicant is trying to build this with no elevators. Elevators are a pretty costly uh, impact. They would need two of them. They're typically 100 to $125,000. And so they are saying they need a waiver to uh, not have elevators, which ties into putting all the accessible units on the ground floor and would additionally incur a cost because they would have to uh, make ADA compliant walkways go all the way out to the sidewalk. So for all of those reasons, there's an entry design waiver. And then uh, the last one has to do again with the objective design standards for buildings with a facade longer than 100 feet. Our typical standard is to ask for an eight foot recess for every 50 feet. Uh, I mentioned there are six recesses and projections along this facade, but they're more in the foot and a half to two foot range. Uh, next topic is CEQA and environmental review. So uh, city consulted with uh, DUDEC. This is a consultant we've used uh, typically for our environmental reviews. They prepared a six page memo that's attached to the staff report. And they concluded that the project was eligible to for a categorical exemption uh, under 15.332 noted here. I'm not gonna read all of the five criteria, but I do wanna highlight criteria A just for, to be clear, so that the project is consistent with the applicable general plan designation and all applicable general plan policies as well as all applicable zoning designation and regulations. Well, the, you know, on uh, again, at face value, if you've got a density bonus project that's bypassing local standards, uh, this would appear to be a problem, but uh, there's actually case law where uh, that involved the city of Berkeley as the defendant and the court was clear that when density bonus is used, uh, this uh, categorical exemption can still apply. Um, we also consulted with uh, DUDEC to do an individual transportation study, specifically to study the intersection at 45th and Capitola. Um, that was not part of the project originally and uh, was a response to um, trying to get acceptable emergency vehicle access. And so that was a later introduction to the project. We, uh, I, I will say it initially, we're not uh, thinking that was the best design, so we wanted to study it. Uh, our consultant came back with um, a couple of recommendations and they also did some uh, parking modeling or sorry, uh, transportation modeling. And their conclusion was that uh, that parking lot would introduce 7 a.m. peak hour trips and 8 p.m. peak hour trips. Uh, they're recommending an adjustment of the median and the crosswalk to realign 
and so that'll become a four-way stop rather than a three-way as it is existing. Um, and the public works director um, met with me and that consultant and ultimately determined that those were the only offsite improvements that would be needed for that intersection. So taking another, another look at that, I uh, just wanted to kind of put a graphic to it. Uh, so the green would be the new driveway as it would approach um, entering on the north side of Capitola Road. I've highlighted in purple there where the existing median is. If you use the pointer here. So the median would, median would move over 10 feet, uh, and the crosswalk now is a, is a bit skewed, and it would square up with, uh, with both sides of, this, of the uh, Capitola Road. Uh, getting into community input, so this is a, these are the supplemental uh, or additional materials that I mentioned. Um, we, I'm just summarizing these. There was definitely more detail in the individual letters that you received, but parking is certainly uh, certainly a comment that we got. Um, but our our fairly simple answer is that the applicant is using a concession to override local standard. Uh, there was some comments about intersection safety. Um, I did just kind of cover that. Um, I will say also though the, the the condition that's being introduced there is is really not uncommon in Capitola. The city hall has two driveways that exit into four-way stops, Knob Hill at Hill and Bay has the same condition uh, with far more traffic than this project is introducing. Uh, there's some concern about high density, just kind of in general. Um, we got a comment that uh, there was just a lack of support from one of the commenters. And then uh, today we received one letter of support uh, saying that affordable housing is in need in the area. Um, almost done, so thank you for bearing with me. Uh, this is just some cleanup items for um, our recommendation. So a couple of amended conditions that we're recommending. Uh, the consultant had a recommendation for a hammerhead at the um, parking lot that accesses um, Capitola Road. They really, uh, the applicant was able to design it without a hammerhead to allow an ability for turning around. The main concern here was having passenger or vehicles back out into the intersection. So they were able to accommodate with another uh, design. So it's really not a concern, but I wanted to take the hammerhead language out of there to avoid confusion. And then 50 is really just uh, drafting oversight. There's a, an area of landscaping along one of the parking lots that <coughs> didn't get shown, and so this uh, makes it clear that that's supposed to be landscaped. So I am at the end of my presentation. Uh, the staff recommendation is to uh, the Planning Commission to uh, exempt the project from CEQA under the noted uh, infill development exemption and approve the project uh, with the design permit, conditional use permit, conditional development permit, and density bonus as requested with the conditions of approval and findings as amended in the prior slide. So Thank with you. that, I'm happy to take questions. Questions? I can jump in. Yeah. Um, three, actually. So you mentioned in one of the slides, you said 40% canopy coverage, but in the presentation, earlier presentation, it was 28%. Is that mature versus initial, or I saw 28% canopy coverage somewhere. That may be existing. Oh, that's what's there now? I don't remember 28%. Well, I guess my concern is as long as we exceed the 15%, I just wondered if that was, 40% is obviously better, so I'm not gonna make a big deal out of it. Anyway, um, while you're looking up that, my next question has to do with the safety concern. Um, since that was brought up since our density bonus discussion, what, has Public Works or the police department weighed in any further on that safety issue? Uh, the Public Works Department, specifically the Public Works Director, was on a couple of different calls with me and the consultant after they had done their analysis. They typically will send us a draft report and allow us to comment on it. So the public works director was involved with that. They, they haven't made any, any further comments or yeah, any? Every, the, the conclusion was um, it's, it's essentially an incremental increase in uh, the use of that intersection. Um, getting into a little bit more detail, 
I, I think the primary concern is turning left out of that parking lot. The consultant is saying that about 20% of those trips would turn left, 80% would turn right uh, toward 41st versus 20% toward Orf. Uh, and then if you look at the PM peak hour, that's the, the worst case of the worst case, that we're introducing eight trips into that intersection over an hour. Now, I'm just wondering, because it would be nice if we had a, a check the box thing from the police department and public works that said, yeah, they've looked at this and approve it. Um, but I understand that, uh, that there's kind of a tacit, tacit consent there. Uh, finally, there was, in the density bonus discussion, uh, Commissioner Westman mentioned uh, the notion of a, maybe a condition that should be considered, which was to have uh, local residents have first priority. Uh, was that discussed any further? I, I know that's not in your conditions now. Um, I, I can comment on that one. So we actually, I, I reached out to the housing authority to ask about that, whether or not they typically get conditions on this type of project. This project has 25 project-based vouchers. So, um, they typically would not allow for residency pre preferences with any project-based voucher units because there's concern about the Fair Housing Act. And if you're saying that um, only residents from Capitola are given preference, when we're talking about the Fair Housing Act, it really needs to be accessible to all. And we're, um, we're, we're a community with um, great infrastructure and schools to, to not allow folks who may be in a neighboring community that doesn't have such a high rating in terms of um, public benefits in schools would be against the Fair Housing Act. So we're suggesting this evening that that, um, although a, a great idea, it really um, is in contrast to the Fair Housing Act. So Thank you. I don't know if Layla would like to add anything else to that. Thank you. Unless there's any questions specifically. No further questions. Is there any other questions? I have a couple questions. Um, one thing, can you explain uh, how the noticing on the project was notified to the community and what steps we did to inform them about the project and the history of that? Yeah, so we sent a uh, newspaper notice three weeks ahead of our pre previously scheduled meeting on the 19th. Uh, two weeks ahead, we sent notices, uh, postcards to tenants and owners listed, and we get this through uh, the tax assessor. So these are mailing addresses associated with uh, the, the taxable um, either owner or uh, occupant space. Um, and then we post the site. So there's a, a stake with a posting there. Um, after our continuance last week, I was able to call the newspaper and have it reposted the following day uh, for the weekend edition in the, in the paper. Um, so that's posted for this meeting on the 25th. Uh, on top of that, uh, the, the voluntary outreach uh, was done by the applicant. I believe they, the applicant reported and sent me a flyer that they said they were going to send to the same 300 foot. I don't know how they obtained their mailing list, but. Those were all the ways to, of outreach that I'm aware of. Perfect. Um, sorry, another, another question. Um, can you go over the height of the building um, on how, you know, from the floor level standpoint, how it comes up to be with the proposed height that's now? Yeah, let's see if I've got a slide that we can kind of walk through. Actually do, do one better. I've, I plotted in the daylight plan in case this became part of the discussion. So I tried to describe this, uh, but if you look, uh, the, the architect has laid out the floor to floor plate heights. Um, so 10 feet per floor going up. And then uh, as I mentioned, the, so the top plate here is 29.2. So that's the top plate of the third floor and uh, I mentioned the rest 
was basically roofline <coughs> architecture that's built in. In the, the building A, Um, it's actually a flat roof behind, so that all of this roof line aesthetic is is basically to, to give the building a top perimeter architecture uh, in front of a flat roof pad. So can I follow up on that question? Yeah. Just a clarification. Yeah. So I noticed T.J. Welsh is in the in the audience, and he talked about height and mentioned that. Uh, Really, you should measure the height requirement to the plate height and not the peak. That way, we would, you know, encourage gabled roofs and that kind of thing, as opposed to a bunch of flat roofs. Is that is that how we measure our height requirement to the plate height or or to the peak roof? No, we we take the the highest projection. So it's typically the ridge uh, in a like a single family home. In this, I would look at the tallest point of the roof uh, straight down to the grade. Um, that's how our code requires it. There are some allowances for projections like chimneys and, and other appurtenances on roofs, but we're just looking at building height. We're looking to the top of a ridge usually. Okay. And just to follow up on the height, um, just for everybody, when you say it's a 10 foot plate, so that's a nine foot high ceiling inter interior with a one foot of framing. I uh, saw, so, you know, what that, it's not a 10 foot high ceiling per floor, okay? Yeah, that's, that's taking into account both roof and ceiling joists. So yeah, interior, clear, probably eight and a half to nine. Okay, thank you. And then the one last question I had um, was on the traffic with the intersection, um, kind of uh, following up on uh, with the question with the safety issue, was there any concern with it being offset off the 45th Avenue? You know, um, I know there's an adjustment that's looking out for the crosswalk, but from the alignment standpoint, other than your comment on just the left-hand turn? Yeah, it, it's not ideal, um, but I, I think ultimately the conclusion from uh, the, 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 both the consultant and the public works director was just that the volume of, of vehicles going through there just wasn't enough that it was a significant impact that required further mitigation or um, that would meet a threshold of you know, not being able to move forward requiring a redesign. They, they did not think that it was that significant of an, of an impact or risk. Thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry, this <clears throat> project is big and so I spent a lot of time trying to understand it and I got a fair number of questions. Um, the first question is, isn't this property within a half mile of the Santa Cruz Metro uh, Capitola Mall Transit Center? And if it is, according to is the way I read it at least, um, <clears throat> on the density bonus law, uh, paragraph BG, uh, they would be um, given a height increase from 27, well, from whatever it was to 33 feet. And, and in addition to that, the way I read it, um, they would be allowed to have uh, 0 0.5 parking spaces per unit, not uh, two and a half <clears throat> that we're asking for. I don't know about the distance specifically to that transit center, but I, I do know that when when the state law talks about high performing transit stops, it's really talking about a rapid transit stop and none of the stops within the city meet that standard. So um, okay. we did look at that aspect, not exactly how you, you're looking at it, but we did look at that. I can actually say um, they're required to, to meet that requirement they have to have 15 minute frequencies. So we actually don't have any in um, our region, the Santa Cruz region that meet that frequency. So um, although like over the hill, there'd be areas with bus rapid transit that would qualify for that or train system, but it doesn't apply here. Okay, good, thank you. Um, back to the notice. I, um, I remember when uh, the Monarch Cove Inn was trying to put some project forward. I forget what it was. I think they were expanding and putting in underground parking or something crazy. Uh, but anyway, the entire uh, Depot Hill neighborhood was uh, noticed on that particular project. So I'm personally quite a ways, I'm well beyond the 300 foot limit. So wouldn't, I mean, isn't that a precedent for a project this big that we should really notify people in a much larger radius than just 300 feet from the project? 
Uh, the, the code actually has a threshold for uh, if over a thousand addresses are within a 300 foot radius that we would do, actually not we would avoid, um, we would do like a, a whole page posting in the newspaper and we don't even have to do mailing. So our code almost goes the other way. I, as far as Monarch Cove, there may have been some additional outreach, but I mean, we're, we're, as far as noticing, we're, we're following the code and um, I, I, mean, I could think of reasons why we wouldn't notice more, um, you know, without the applicant's pres permission as well. So uh, we're, we're following the code as it's written. Okay. Um, parking, <clears throat> parking is a little bit of a, you know, to me it is a bit of a nightmare. So without getting, going into a lot of numbers, um, in the United States, the average is uh, 1.89 vehicles per household in 2021. I looked around and tried to see what the variance is over uh, income levels per household. Uh, there's really not much of a variance until you get down to less than about $20,000 per year income. And then you see a drop from the 1.8 number down to something lower than that. And I, I did some, <clears throat> some analysis of this and <clears throat> they have a kind of a deficit of anywhere between about 32 parking spots to down to about 12 if I take kind of the minimum from those low income houses. It, did we ask them, the developer, if they could come up with some creative ways to house those vehicles uh, by perhaps leasing parking spots from some of the local commercial companies for an overnight stay, for example? There are you know commercial entities across the street. Uh, there's the Capitola Mall, which has oodles of parking these days at least. Um, because I'm worried that you're gonna fill up 44th Street, 45th Street um, with cars, you know, at, certainly at night and who knows during the daytime as well. And, the, you know, I walked around there and there's not a whole heck of a, I walked around on a Thursday in the afternoon and there was not a lot of room on 44th Street. So it, it feels like parking is gonna be a problem for the community. <clears throat> yeah, I, I think our, S summary is that if they propose a concession, we we have to take it at face value. Um, I know that that's not an answer that uh, probably some interested in the project are, are going to want to hear. But if we're going to follow state law, um, that's how we have read this and analyzed it. Uh, I think from a real world perspective, I have talked to the applicant about. Uh, I believe they own and manage eight or nine other <coughs> similar types of of properties and so I I think they're prepared to talk about a little bit about that and how they are ultimately as a property manager comfortable with this number of parking so uh, when it's their time to speak we can ask them to okay uh, yeah uh, I mean they have the way I read it they have one um, one project in San Diego that's actually operating and they've got eight others that are in development right now at varying stages um, so speaking of the developer <laughs> there's a letter from um, Myers Nave and in that letter, they talk about a financing mechanism and it says uh, to finance the implementation and monitoring costs of this project. Is that something we're paying for? No, no. no. Do, you, do you remember what that reference is? I've read that letter a couple of times. I don't, I don't. It's you know. kind of like an odd sentence, sort of in the middle at the bottom. It's like, I don't know what he was talking about. Um, yeah, and the other, the only, well, let's get back to the height. So uh, in your shot you had before of the, of, of the daylight plan, you know, one thing that kind of, well, I guess I would say irritated me is, that, you know, they, they could have shown us that daylight plane in a simple CAD model with the tools we have today. Just, it feels like at winter solstice, uh, you know, December 21st, they were gonna shadow the Capitola Gardens uh, quite a bit. Uh, those, there's a set of units that are kind of right off building B that I think are gonna be in the dark for uh, around sunset. Um, but they used a six and 12 pitch on those particular gables. I mean, and, and they used a four and 12 elsewhere. I mean, they could at least cut it down a little bit, right? And it wouldn't, I don't feel it would really affect the project that much from a look standpoint. Architect is here, so I think he could respond to that. Okay. Um, 
yeah, I, like everybody else, that intersection at, in the evening rush hour is a nightmare. There's a, one car every 5.6 seconds goes through that, and uh, I, I don't think we can do much about that, unfortunately. <clears throat> That's it. Thank you. Um, just to be clear, I have a question. <laughs> just to be clear, um, because of the state mandate, we can't, if, if they're offering these concessions, we can't um, necessarily, you know, if we had a problem with the height, we said, you know, we would like it to only be three stories. There's not really anything they're offering it. We can't demand the they do that kind the, of thing. The bar on that would be, be pretty high, so we, we do have to take these at face value. We would have to demonstrate that there is some... <clears throat> uh, demonstrably significant impact to public health and safety. Mm -hmm. And presenting that, okay. But, but nothing prevents us from asking questions to see what they could do, right? We can talk to the developer about- We can always bargain. Flexibility and, and options, yes. Okay, okay. Um, does anybody else have any more questions? I just one follow up. Can you just elaborate on the, uh, from the code standpoint on the notification you said, um, I didn't follow, I didn't track when you said that you were not allowed to over notice, if you want to call it that. Um, you said the developer would have an issue with that? Yeah, I was just, I don't know if the developer would, but if we are, uh, as staff, deviating from the code and noticing people that are not required to be noticed, um, you know, I, I, that's not a, not a decision that I would want to make at my desk. So I, again, I'm just I with noticing that. we're following the code. Yeah, I was just wondering if there's ever been another project that was on a larger scale like this that we look at in Capitola that's been ever noticed more than that, or is that just a standard? And I was looking for information. That question's been asked to me, so that's why I'm posing the question. <clears throat> there have been instances such as the, um, the Monarch Cove Inn where the Planning Commission has directed staff to uh, reach out to more properties and, and possibly the hotel in the village when we did the conceptual review. But there, there have been a few since in the last nine years since I've been here, like less than a half dozen, I would say, that we've had those requests. But they have been made in the past and it usually comes from the Planning Commission. Thank you. Or City Council. <clears throat> okay. Any other questions? No. Um, would the applicant like to speak? Is the applicant present? I gotta sign one. Yes, please. <laughs> Thank you. us. Um, I'm Garrett Bascom. I'm the project manager for uh, CRP Affordable on this project. Um, I also have my colleague Jack Bertelson over here who's the finance director from CRP. This is um, Bob Lindley, the project architect. So I wanted to give just a brief overview of our company and of the of uh, why this site is a good site for affordable housing and then I'm going to let Bob give a brief overview of the project and then I'm, I'm sure you guys have a lot of questions. So we'll get into that. So a little bit of background. CRP started its uh, affordable branch back in 2017. Um, we have projects located all throughout California. As you mentioned, we have some in San Diego, some in uh, Worthington, or the, sorry, the Imperial Valley. Um, total, we have in operation around 250 units that are currently operating, and we have another um, approximately seven projects with 700 affordable homes under construction. Most of those will be complete by around this time next year. Um, and we have another 20 projects or so in various stages of the design process, this one being one of them. We're, we're really excited about this one, um, specifically for the location. Um, the main reason is because of its proximity to a lot of amenities, um, such as uh, the Capitola Mall, like you mentioned, there's the supermarket, a public library, the J Street Park, Lots and lots of restaurants, CVS, places of worship, worship, 
Um, bus routes, like you mentioned, not necessarily high transit or uh, high volume ones, but they are they are within walking distance. Um, and like you like you mentioned, um, parking is always a concern with these projects, and so we take that into uh, you know it, it's very important for us, and we take that into consideration. So being within you know walking distance of um, lots of amenities as well as public transportation is really important, which is why this site is. Uh, a, a great one in our minds. Um, it kind of was brought up, but not really. Uh, 25 of our units are project-based vouchers, which means the income threshold for those is a 30% of the AMI, the average medium income, which depending on the unit you get is anywhere between, um, I have it here, between 34 and 48 thousand dollars a year, depending on size of family and the size of the unit you get, and so we are proposing a one-to-one -one parking ratio. But what we found in the projects that we have is, you know, with that m many units, the majority of those being at that level of income, a one-to-one -one parking ratio is successful. Y you will have parking on the street. That's obvious. That will happen but it still will be a successful project. One thing I'll bring up is, you know, we own and operate these for 55 years. We're locked into that by the state of California. So the last thing we want is to have a project that doesn't function well and have, you know, kind of an operational nightmare. Um, and kind of as uh, you mentioned, I believe, Paul, at one point we actually considered a 0.5 parking ratio based on the transit, but, you know, based on the location and, and the fact that it didn't quite qualify under those technical legalities, you know, it didn't really work that way. And so we, we kind of drifted away from that as the project evolved. Um, yeah, that's, that, I'll, that's for me and I'll let you go, Bob. Um, um, my name is Bob Lindley. I'm a principal architect uh, with Studio T-Square. We're, we're based in Oakland. Uh, I personally live in Davis. Uh, when we work from home, we, um, we basically are working from all over sites in California. Um, I want to thank um, Brian for the, for the great uh, overview of the project. I don't think I could improve on what he's said in terms of describing the project. I would go ahead and, and make a couple of comments about how we ended up with the design that we have. And it did, it did begin with uh, a lot of, you know, heart-to-heart -heart discussions with planners. And, and I really want to, you know, um, complement planning here in, in Capitola. They're very collegial and, and willing to work with the developer if they see that the developer wants to do a good project. So we appreciate that. Um, we started out with a building that was basically uh, fronting Capitola Road all the way down with the parking completely concealed behind the building, uh, which did a couple of things for us. It, it concealed all the parking from view from, 40, uh, from Capitola Road. It also uh, did not require that we would have an, an entrance into the parking from Capitola Road. So it was going to be 100% from 44th. The other thing that it did was that it allowed the building, the mass of the building, which is, you know, albeit nine feet taller than the, the code requires normally, uh, to completely comply with the cutoff uh, angle for for that daylight. So basically we had, we had our parking, it was about you know, 20, almost 30 feet deep uh, before we even got to a building form. So it completely complied with, with that. When we went um, to look at that with, um, with your fire department, they were not happy with that design. They wanted us to include a hammerhead turnaround or a through, uh, a through version that would exit to 44th Street. So when we looked at that, we realized we would have to reduce the number of units by maybe a quarter on the project to make that happen, to create enough you know, space. And we would have lost parking in the, as a result as well and open space for the residents. So we thought that it was really important to preserve open space, as much parking as we could, and create a building that, that was aesthetically pleasing to the city. So we, at that point, changed the design completely into a two, two building design, one with the main building facing for uh, Capitola Road, and then a second building at an angle going back towards the rear property. So to make that work, uh, we did need to get into that setback where we, where we weren't violating it originally. We did with the new design, 
but that allowed us now to have two parking areas with a depth of 150 feet, which is the magic number for uh, the fire marshal. So they allow us to do a 150 foot dead end uh, access for fire. So now we're, we're keeping the fire department happy, we're making, making sure that we have good, good response for um, emergency vehicles. And in, as a result, we were able to create, I think, a better overall site plan where there's, where there's more variety of building form there's a setback for the building B uh, so that its perceived height from the street is much lower now. Um, we've made the uh, community building more front and center and that's really a one story element. Uh, so for, for a major portion of the frontage of the road, we're, we're either at one story or even lower. We're doing a lot of tree planting along there. We're putting in bioswales along the street frontage so that we can create a really nice uh, green edge uh, which is in keeping with, with Capitola. So um, for, for those reasons, I, I, I won't go further, but we would certainly um, be willing to take any of your questions about how we arrived at the design we did. So thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, yeah, uh, thank you, Garrett, for coming up from San Diego and. Um, presenting this project to us. Uh, is this a um, wood construction or steel and concrete? Wood so we, construction. So we could drop the uh, ceiling height to eight feet and drop the overall height by three feet at least. Theoretically, but you might want something. Else. So yeah, it's the, the building height is based on a, a fairly typical floor, floor ceiling assembly, which is a TJI joist. Um, with fire, you know, there's fire protection, there's uh, acoustic protection. So those assemblies tend to be around 14 inches deep. So if we go 10 foot floor to floor, that will give us a, around an eight foot eight clear ceiling height. Mm -hmm. um, we could go as low as eight feet, but it <clears throat> becomes very difficult to accommodate plumbing, light fixtures and things like that. And we get some, some spaces then that have to be softened down that get very low uh, to the code minimum of seven feet, and that's only allowed in hallways, kitchens, bathrooms. So what we found, and we've done a lot of this kind of housing, is that the 10 foot floor to floor really, really helps uh, to give a little bit more ceiling height than those units. And I don't think that, you know, overall we would, we, it's really only two floor ceiling assemblies that we're talking about. If we were to decrease that to the code minimum eight feet, we might pick up as much as one foot in overall height on the building, and I doubt that that would even be perceptible. A follow up on the, your question about the roof pitch. Could you elaborate on that? On the what? On the roof pitch. The roof pitch uh, is, I think we can be flexible on that if, if you felt, uh, and you made a comment, we had a six and 12, and we had five and 12, we could even go to four and 12. Or just, just a reminder, everybody turn Sorry. off your phones. Okay. <laughs> um, we're, we're flexible on the roof pitch. We could certainly look at lowering it slightly. It's, it's from a design standpoint. From a design yeah. standpoint, yes, I yeah. think so. I mean, it's, it really is, it's the thing, we, we look at an overall composition of the building, and, and Typically, when you go with a taller building, you want a little bit steeper roof pitch because it just proportionally feels more appropriate to the design. You look at a lot of the old Frank Lloyd Wright, low, you know, one-story, two-story buildings have very low pitch roofs. That prairie style looks great. Um, when you do a low pitch on a taller building, sometimes it looks a little squashed. So we want the building to look great. You know, I'd echo what Garrett said that, you know, we. We do a lot of this housing, um, and we, we put as much into these affordable projects as we do with our market rate. We want them to fit really well in the neighborhood <laughs> and to be well received. They're gonna be there a long time. So we could look at that though, we're willing to. And I'm sorry, one other question, I should know the answer to this, but looking at the plan, uh, the units are, it has like a mansard more or less on the top on the roof. Correct. So is there mechanical equipment on the roof deck? Right, and there, that's, that's a, a conscious effort to do that. If we were to go with a fully pitched roof, it would be quite high in the center because of the depth of the building. So what we do is we play a little trick here. and we, we do the mansards, but we make them, you know, look, look real from the street and from the from ground, plane, ground plane. But it then gives us a flat roof area where we can put mechanical equipment and it's not seen by anyone. 
uh, rather than having condensing units on the ground where you run into them, et cetera. The other thing that it helps us with is that we are planning to put in a good amount of uh, solar PV. So the flat roof is excellent for that. We can then rack them and get them oriented the right pitch and you don't see them either. So those are two reasons. So you condition my heat pump or? Uh, we, it's an all electric building. Okay. So we are, we are looking at greenhouse gas reduction very seriously and <coughs> our climate change. Um, so it is an all electric building. These will be heat pump uh, units. So all the condensers will be up on the roof? We are, yes, yes. I mean, so the I, I'm, I'm, Yeah, I'm hesitating because I think on this project we are going with fan coils and heat pumps on the roof, so yes. Yeah, correct. so the Mansard's gonna be screening. Exactly. The, approximately 36 units, uh, 30, 36 condensing units, or are they gonna be like multi-slave units? I mean. These, they'll be individual units okay. uh, for each each uh, each unit. So there would be 36, there'd be 24 on one building, 12 on the other. Perfect. And then just one last question. Um, when you talk about solar array, is that being designed in now? Because I know sometimes when you look at the solar array layout later, you know, it needs to be adjusted. And so then that comes back to adjust. Aesthetically, maybe the height looks taller because the right. array is taller. Is that been engineered in and that's gonna sit below the mansard you proposed? We do engineer it in from the beginning and yes, it will be sitting below sight lines for the mansards. So in the mansard, we'll have all the mechanical unit and the solar array so that there won't be an issue with that. Correct, proposal. yes. Perfect. Thank you. So can I ask a follow-up question? Because I, I need a clarification on this daylight plane concern, the Paul, that you had. Could we maybe look, at, bring up the one of the views of the building? So uh, if I understand your concern, Paul, you said that there, there's a shadowing effect yep. on a neighbor. Correct. Could, you, could you point that out? And is that what we're talking about, changing the roof pitch in order to, to address go, that concern? Go to the site plan. Uh, it's by the way, on the site plan, we had the APN number of the neighbor, not this property. Um, uh, can I stand up and point? Will people see that? It helped me. <laughs> <laughs> so if you go where you, uh, to the, yeah, a little bit more to the right, and then from that corner, you go up. You're, you think you're gonna shadow some of the Capitola Garden units that are up north of this particular property in the winter time when the sun is, set. well, in the winter time when the sun is coming up and winter time when the sun is setting. So oh. you're, you're talking about changing the pitch of the roof of those units that face well, that I was just area? Well, I was just trying to be nice to the neighbors and not shadow them. Well, exactly, so I wanna know if that's the same topic that you guys are talking I, about. I think it's, it's a really good comment, Paul, and I think, I think we do that already, but if we don't, we can. So if we look at the elevation of the north facade of building B, mm -hmm. it's possible to pull that up. I think we already do show a uh, basic mansard hip roof there instead of a gable. But it, so it's similar, I think, to the lower right hand corner there. You see how the yeah. roof comes down. So there's no gable at that end. So we do maximize the amount of, of light that will come in. The other thing I, I'd point out too is that um, we kind of got a little bit lucky here. I know trees are not forever, you know, especially <laughs> with the kind of storms we're getting. Um, but there's a really nice stand of redwood trees right along the property where that building sits. And so I think it's, the trees are gonna do a pretty good job of hiding that, that mass from those neighbors to the north. The other comment about that is the, the, the neighbors to the north is mostly parking along the frontage just behind our, so I don't think it's gonna be shading much of their usable open space. Uh, it's mainly gonna be their carports and the driveway, et cetera. Yeah, there's, a, if couple of units, you can see them on the page A 1.0. Um, like I said, in the summer, in the winter, at the sunset, sunrise, you're gonna shadow a few units. But you know, yep. you're right, but there's a lot of trees there, which actually is beneficial to your particular design, which I think is a good design, by the way. Thanks. From a, you know, a street uh, standpoint, just looking at it, it's a nice design. <clears throat> Any additional questions for the applicant? Um, they, do you have any solutions for possible overflow parking like staff was suggesting? One thing we are doing, I, I know this, this doesn't park a car, but we are providing a lot of uh, secure bicycle parking. Um, 
And, you know, again, as you mentioned, this is a great site. It's walkable uh, to services. And um, it is it has been our experience. And I've, I've been uh, designing affordable housing for about 15 years now. It's been become kind of a specialty. And we've done communities from Lake Tahoe down to, you know, San Diego and everywhere in between. And what I have heard back from our affordable developers is that a one-to-one -one parking ratio for a family project does work, uh, mm -hmm. that oftentimes there are still parking spaces available, believe it or not. A lot of, a lot of folks just can't afford a car, especially if they can live close to transit. Uh, if, they can, if it's a bikeable community, they can have a bike. So we do try to, we do try to provide a um, good amount of bike parking space for folks so they can be encouraged to do that. Um, within your management practice, is there any mitigation that you, a yeah. guidance for each um, tenant of, you know, maybe a please don't crowd the street? <laughs> um, it's a good question. I have to get back to our director of operations, but it, it's it's an ongoing thing. You know, every space is, is assigned their stall and they work with the tenants as they come in. So for example, we have a lot of compact stalls. They would work with the tenants if they have a big truck or something to move them around if they, if they need to. But that, that's part of the ongoing maintenance of the project for the duration of the, of the mm -hmm. timeline. Okay. Is there any additional questions for the applicant? No? Okay. Um, thank you very much. We appreciate all of your input. So with that, we're gonna open the public hearing. And as a reminder, again, we have a lot of interest in the application. And um, I asked during public comment that everyone is respectful and lets everybody else speak and take their turn. Um, and then also that we refrain from applause or reactions, just, just a side note. And um, with that, we're gonna open the public hearing and... Three minutes. Thank you, sorry, excuse me. Vice Chair, I do have a couple of public speakers on Zoom who've had their hands raised for uh -huh. the duration of the presentation, so just let me know when you'd like them to speak versus okay. in-person public comment. Sh should we take those first or should we do a Oh, thank you. <laughs> Let's, um... The general Zoom link is not working. That is why I had to come here in person. Oh. So we have a log screen on the screen, but it's not working. Oh. Okay. 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 All right, well, let's take um, public comment right now, if, and then we'll move to the Zoom. Does that sound good? Okay, and all right. Three minutes. Three, uh, each person is limited to three minutes, and um, we'll keep track. Yes. Good evening, Mayor. I'm Paula Bradley and I live at 1841 44th Avenue around the corner from the project. I submitted a letter, but I would still like answers to the questions that I posed, which um, I haven't heard answers to those yet. Since parking is reduced from 2.5 spaces to one space per unit, how will the demand for parking be limited? If one unit has two or more vehicles, they'll be parking on 44th, 45th, 46th, if a resident with three vehicles applies for a unit, will this be considered in the application process? And will on-site parking be assigned? Concerning the compact parking spaces, how will the management uh, make sure that only compact vehicles are parked in those spaces? As we all know from any parking lot, uh, cars park in any parking space they can find that's open, and that creates a problem as you know, um, there's no guest parking, so everybody has a guess, where will they park? Um, landscaping should be required to be maintained in a healthy, thriving condition. Trees are not gonna reach a 44% canopy unless they're thriving, and the landscape won't mature either. Please add a condition to maintain the landscaping 
in a healthy, growing, thriving condition for the life of the project. Trees are only being replaced one to one, not at the required two to one ratio. So is it possible to have off-site tree replacement? Capitola needs more trees, not less trees. Um, I asked about the bicycle parking, the long-term uh, bicycle storage, how that's gonna be secured from theft. People are not gonna be able to park there unless they're sure it's secured. Nobody's gonna wanna carry their e-bike up to the second or third floor. And what is the oval shown on the site plan that's behind the uh, playground? Is that a, a pet exercise area by any chance? And if it isn't, this project should have one. Um, the design overall looks good to me. However, on 44th Avenue, that elevation looks more like a back than a frontage. So it, it's not gonna look good on 44th Avenue. That's also a street frontage. There's only a small door and two windows. Um, and, and then there, it was brought up about, about the notices and um, there was only one very small eight and a half foot by 11 uh, posted on the front on Capitola Road. There should have been one on 44th Avenue. I only saw it because I walk my dogs. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening, commissioners. I live on 46th Avenue. Uh, 46th Avenue has only a few single family homes on the east side of the street. Both the south and north ends have multifamily apartment buildings and the entire west side of the street consists of multifamily apartment buildings and con condominiums. While these apartments and condos provide some parking to their tenants, there is significant overflow of additional cars parked the entire length of the street. Add in the homeless that are living in their vehicles taking up parking. There is not enough street parking to accommodate all of, of the current residents. I walk my dogs in the early morning and witness residents probably coming home after the midnight shift, circling around and looking for street parking. Sometimes even the fire hydrants are blocked with parked cars. I've seen them idling in the street and they wait for another resident to, to get in the car and leave for work in the morning so they can park their car and finally go home. Uh, 46th Avenue is also congested with parking Sundays for the church when and when events happen in the village. I have to search for street parking for my own car to ensure my visitors have a place to park in my reserve spot. Developers request a waiver to have a one-to-one -on -one ratio of units and parking spaces. When the Capitola standard is 2.5, 42% of these spaces will be for the compact cars only, which means residents of the bluffs will be parking their additional and or larger cars on the surrounding streets as will their visitors. This neighborhood already protested the proposed uh, rezoning of Capitol Avenue to accommodate four story structures over five years ago. The developers have, re have requested a waiver to the height restrictions. A three story structure in a small space is too tall and does not fit in this neighborhood. There are no housing or business buildings around it that are that tall nor should there be. If the Planning Commission relaxes these existing rules and grants the developers these exceptions, it will be determined, it will be detrimental to the quality of existing residents. This neighborhood is already inundated with residents, cars, and traffic and cannot accommodate anymore. This project is being imposed on this neighborhood and it is not welcomed. Thank you. Thank you very much. What was your name? Uh, did you sign in? I did. Yes, yeah, what was your name? I'm sorry. Michelle Henderson. Thank you, Michelle. Good evening. Uh, my name is Philip Cross. I live on 42nd Avenue. And the only reason I know about this meeting from walking my dog on Capitola Avenue and seeing the, the posting on the site, uh, and I'm here to oppose it. Um, 
I don't know, some, I've learned a lot this evening reading about the density rules and, and it sounds like you're gonna be railroaded into approving this thing. Um, what I think actually request you guys do is have another meeting, put out mail notices out to a quarter mile radius. The room would be filled with people opposing if you did that. Um, there's gonna be at least 30 extra cars parked all over the place like Michelle was saying, it's gonna be bad. I'm, at the end of my street on 42nd Avenue, there's apartments there and it's the same type of thing. It's blocked up all the time. And it's only, on half the street is only parking on. It's gonna be very bad. And even if there was enough parking spaces for this project, the, um, the traffic would be too dense as it is. I've, I've lived in my house for uh, 35 years now. And, and in a quarter mile radius, it, there, there, there's lots of more houses where the, down the street there was one house and there's some orchard tree, like 15 houses. End of the street, there's four big houses where there was two little houses. And I can't see Loma Prieta anymore, but they built another house on Grace Street. And, and it's just too much density already in our city. So I, what I'm asking you to do is to postpone this, have another meeting with a more wider mailing and notice more people because uh, this project is, is bad for the reasons I stated. Um, so I'm against it. Thank you. Thank you. It's hard for me to write. <laughs> I'll uh, get it in. Okay. Hi, my name's Melody Newcomb. I live at 1763 44th Avenue. I live right almost where the entrance comes out of that parking lot. My neighbor, Phyllis, who's in her 80s, lives right on the other side of me. She's about five feet from where the entrance is of your 15 space is coming out, and I'm right on the other side of Phyllis. Phyllis wanted me to tell you tonight that when she tries to back out of her driveway right now, because of the cars that are parked there already in the trucks, that she's afraid she's gonna hit somebody, she's gonna hit a car, or she's gonna hit, you know, she's, she's gonna injure somebody. And I have had the same problem. Across from my street is the Capitola Gardens, 96 units, 87 parking spaces, and the overflow is always on our street. I have dealt with that, and I've lived in this house for 23 years. I want you to know I'm an occupational therapist. I've done home care in this county for the last 10 years. So I understand affordable housing. That's not the issue. The issue is the density and the traffic and the parking, because I've been in everybody's home except for probably all of you guys' homes. But I live in this community and I walk by that area probably every day. I take a night walk, I look at the traffic patterns and I know I can't even turn on my own street half the time. Sometimes I have to go to 42nd Avenue or 43rd Avenue to come back to 44th Avenue to get to my own home. I, I tow, I want you to know. I have people on my street. It's kind of like a dumping ground at the end. There's motorhomes, there's boats, cars left, cars on jacks. And I'm calling all the time to get these taken out of the area because I wanna maintain the quality of my neighborhood. So I have apartments on one side, across, and now you're gonna have them on the other. You're gonna affect my quality of life. And I do wanna stay there. I do wanna see my grandchildren grow up. I do understand we need affordable housing but I do think the density for this area and this project is not a good idea. You get the Wharf to Wharf race, you get the Capitola Art and Wine Festival, you get a lot of events, a lot of traffic already goes down the street and you're just gonna make it miserable for the residents that live there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Melody. Hello, my name is Shane Melhon. I'm a resident on 46th Street. I just wanna bring up uh, some concerns that, first off, I wanna say I'm all for affordable housing, but this is one of the worst projects I've ever seen. Um, there's not enough parking. There's not enough parking for the staff or the maintenance team that are, that's gonna be needed to run this property. Um, you're putting it right on the sidewalk. It's too close to the road for a three-story building. I've also noticed uh, before this meeting last week, I sent out 60 notices 
Of those 60 notices, 45 people had no idea this meeting was going on, 45. Um, of the proposed building that you're saying is a three-story building that will overlook into the Capitol Gardens community. You guys didn't uh, make them do a privacy wall or anything. I've worked affordable housing. I know how many people they are allowed in there. You're proposing a project for at least 167 people. That's too many people for that tiny little sliver of land. And I just want to let you know this community opposes it. And if there was proper notices, there would be a lot more people here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shane. Good evening, commissioners. I'm Mick Ruth. I live in the Jewel Box, actually right around the corner from this intersection. I've been there for 52 and a half years. So I've seen a lot at this intersection, a lot of incidents, a lot of near misses. Uh, I believe this project's really incompatible with the surrounding area, especially architecturally. But my main concern is the intersection. Uh, Brian mentioned uh, one other intersection in the community, Knob Hill Market. That's more like an actual street that runs into Knob Hill Market and aligns with the other, other street across the way. This driveway does not align with 45th Avenue, which makes it a very difficult to make that eye contact when you're across the intersection from somebody or in any one of the four avenues of, of that intersection. Uh, you know, it, it, he also stated it's without the concession, it violates every provision in our, in our zoning code. Uh, most of us that use that intersection, pedestrians, bicycles, drivers, there's a lot of pedestrians use that. A lot of accidents have occurred there in the past. In fact, just a couple months ago, there was a lady jogging, 62 years old, was hit in the crosswalk. Um, she was a friend of my niece and nephews. Uh, she was critically injured, spent six weeks in the hospital, and now is spending up to a year in a rehab facility because every bone on the left side of her body was shattered by the impact. Those are the kind of things that occur at that intersection, not frequently, but they do occur. And this is just going to acerbate that situation and make it worse. People frequently run the stop sign. When traffic backs up, they come down the right turn only lane and then they shoot straight through the intersection to get ahead of all the traffic. So, you know, we've done a lot of improvements in the city in the past few years to make the road safer for pedestrians and vehicles. Uh, just Clare Street, most recently. Uh, I don't want to see us backpedal. We, I don't want to make this intersection less safe than what it is. Uh, so if you could use your authority to revise the site plan, it's a blank slate, as I mentioned in my letter. They can accommodate those buildings any way they want on that site and eliminate that driveway. So that's what I'm asking you to do. So please don't approve it with the driveway. Listen to the residents that live by there and use that intersection several times a day. Thanks. Thank you. Nick. Good evening, guys. Um, I'm here because the Zoom link that's in your notice does not work. So um, I even tried when I got here on my phone to see if it would work and it does not work. So there is a problem with notifying the public. I only found out about this because of a concerned neighbor. And I live three houses down from that intersection of 45th and Capitola Road. My grandfather bought the land on 45th Avenue in 1952 and built the house back then when there was fields across the street. I've seen, my family has seen development happen. They've seen things change, but this change does not fit our community. Um, I'm concerned about all of the things that have been mentioned, but also my son goes to New Brighton Middle School. He walks home. He uses that intersection to cross, as does a lot of kids, and it's already a dangerous intersection at 45th and Capitola. And to add more cars to that and a second, or I guess a, making a four-way stop is going to be um, a safety issue. The parking is also an issue. 
My 16 year old daughter has her license. If she has to park far away from our home because somebody else is parking in front of our house and a 16 year old girl who comes home from soccer practice late at night is attacked because she has to park far away, that's a safety issue. And that is a huge concern. It's already a concern about the amount of cars that get that we get from overflow from uh, Diamond Street, from the um, from the condos over there. They're parking all along, and it, it changes every day. And every you can drive down our street during the middle of the day, and you're like, oh, there's plenty of parking here. You come by at 10 o'clock at night. There's not parking. There's not parking at 6 a.m. Um, people come and go. So I truly believe in affordable housing. My own sister was homeless for quite a while, and I believe that we need affordable housing. But the amount of units that they're trying to squeeze into this tiny lot is unacceptable. And I ask that you notify the public of these hearings in a larger spectrum and not just finding out from a different neighbor and that you require it to be a smaller number of units for this project and there needs to be a huge revamp of everything. Thank you. Thank you very much. Kathleen Shovel. Somebody put the cap on. I'm watching that timer, so I don't want to get behind. <laughs> Good evening, Vice Chair Christensen, Peter, Paul, Jerry. It's good to see you guys again. I sent you uh, my concerns and what I could in a kind of a quick manner because it seemed like this has happened so quick. This has happened, and maybe it's the the storm that got away from us and time just went by. But I looked at it; it's only been like three weeks since the application, and so I was thinking about this process. How did, how did we get to a point where, in three weeks, a developer can present a project and and go for approval? Honestly, I can never think of this happening in my eight years when I was on the planning commission that we had that time. But beyond that, it's, it's kind of the process. We talked about noticing and, and Katie uh, pointed out that on these large projects, we send out noticing and ask for noticing in larger areas. And, and this is one of those cases, it's gonna affect more than just that uh, very small 300 uh, feet area. So uh, noticing is part of it, but also we, you, we don't have our consite committee anymore. All this information used to come to us. So you do have our REM who, by the way, built my firehouse was beautiful. I love living in it. But um, no interaction really between you folks on the planning commission and God bless Paul and Jerry who just got voted in and, and here they are with one of the largest projects they got to deal with. So a lot of issues and I think a lot of it is we just need some time to uh, really review. There's a lot of discussions. We talked about height. I, I read some height uh, issues, and while they are afforded the the uh, concession or, or waivers, it would be in this case, um, the waiver was, from what I read, in, in a city suit in one, is um, based on the height needed to approve their extra floor. So in this case, it would be 30 feet. Of course, you'd end up with a flat top roof, so you have to do architecture, but I think that should be your choice and, and not uh, RRM and staff making those decisions for you and just presenting to you in a short time frame. So, um, you know, my request is that you continue this item, send out more noticing, get more feedback, and let's really dive into the project. I, I'm glad people brought up some of the concerns about the intersection. It is not like Knob Hill. This, this is completely different. You have a driveway that's offset. It's a driveway. It's not really noticed as a, a stop like you would have at, at Knob Hill. Uh, I happen to attend church in that uh, right next door, and I watch um, I happen to be on the safety team, and I watch that uh, intersection, uh, well, almost every weekly, so every week. So it has a lot of concern there, and I think the congestion, being a firefighter, I understand the fire marshal's concern uh, of uh, getting, having access into the reason 150 feet is because that's the length of our hose to get us to the, uh, to the building. And there's a lot of other concerns, I think, that we could look at um, as far as parking and maybe you know, how we could make that really fit into the community. I think we need affordable housing. I wish it was for our seniors. Uh, un unfortunately, the elevators uh, eliminate that. So thank you very much. Thank you, TJ. Yes, it's my turn. 
I've never been to a planning commission meeting, so if I do anything wrong, <laughs> let me know. Madam Chairperson and uh, Planning Commission, I'm sorry that you have to deal with this project. Um, little history, uh, used to be an old city council member that lived about 500 feet from here. Whenever he saw something he didn't like on the TV, on the meeting, he'd walk over here. I fortunately lived close enough where I was able to pull that off. A little winded, but uh, I made it. Um, this project is probably one that, uh, had you had time to review it, you'd reject it for many reasons. Unfortunately, uh, buildings like mobile homes, we have no say over the state dictates what we have to do. Recently, you were all dealt with ADUs and what the state dictated you had to do. And they went against probably most of the policies we have in this city. Most of the, of the policies that the eight years I served People would get upset if you brought up something about height or density or traffic, especially traffic and parking, which let's not kid anybody. It's the worst in this city. It's always been the worst. Even the pictures in the 20s show the parking problems. So here you are at the task of dealing with all these mandates and waivers that go against everything you believe in. And I don't fault staff because they're presenting a project they need to present. And I do believe we need affordable housing, desperately. And I was hopeful that there was a big site in town that was gonna deliver that to us someday. And, that, and the other thing that comes up is people worry about arena numbers. And there's no pressure on the arena numbers. The arena numbers are our effort to make an effort to try to provide housing, not whether we deliver housing. And I don't think we've ever not tried to deliver housing. And we were open to multiple housing units at the mall, should that project ever reappear. <clears throat> so I believe that this project may be too big to put on your plate. And I think when I get something where there's enough of this, uh, people in the neighborhoods that have dissension and concerns and issues about noticing, you know, whether they didn't over notice, when we do big projects, skate park, hotel, Monarch Cove, we notice. We didn't want to over notice here because there's legal problems. So my thing to you is, and I don't even know if this is possible, there's not an attorney here, but if you can kick this to the city council, that's what I would do. Let them figure this out. You should decide what fits in this town, and you already know that this doesn't fit. And if they could have got by the, one, the, the, the uh, half parking because of the 15 minute timing, believe me, there'd be half parking. Everything they could do, and this, I'm not faulting them. They're doing a good thing to provide housing but the burden shouldn't fall on your back. Let the big boys make this decision. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Is there anybody else that'd like to come up? Do we we still do have three speakers on Zoom, beginning with Kalisha Webster, who I've just allowed to speak. Um, Kalisha, if you could please unmute yourself. Uh, good evening, commissioners. Thank you. My name is Kalisa Lester, and I'm a senior housing advocate of Housing Choices, a nonprofit service provider helping people with developments with other disabilities find and retain affordable housing throughout San Mateo County. I'm calling in support of CRP's project proposal for 4401 and 4525 Capital Road. This site is ideally situated near transit, shopping, and community amenities, making it the perfect location for development of a walkable, bikeable, and more sustainable community. And by including deeply affordable, extremely low-income housing, the project has the potential to more equitably serve the city's most vulnerable special needs population and help to meet the city's legal mandate to affirmatively further fair housing. CRP's proposed development helps the city in meeting its greener goals for the deepest levels of affordability, which are most difficult to achieve, but most importantly, it creates homes for the most vulnerable members of the community at greatest risk of displacement or homelessness due to the high cost of housing in the region. The city of Capitola is home to nearly 100 adults with developmental disabilities, of whom less than half have been able to transition to living independently, not by choice, but because of the lack of deeply affordable housing available to them. Adults with developmental disabilities typically have 
fixed income from disability benefits or part-time and low-wage jobs in the city due to the lack of extremely low-income units. We also support the developer's request to decrease the number of parking spaces in order to maximize the residential capacity of the site due to the project's proximity to transit, shopping, and community amenities, and because we see not only in our own work, as most people with developmental disabilities do not drive or own a car, but studies of projects including extremely low-income households show that they have significantly lower parking needs than higher-income households. We look forward to seeing this project move through the development process and hope to see the housing potential of the site maximized in order to create a more inclusive and sustainable capital of. Thank you, Kalisha. <laughs> the following speaker will be Cynthia. I've just allowed her to speak. If you could please unmute yourself. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Hi, my name is Cynthia. I am a uh, resident at 44th Avenue. Um, I am all for affordable housing. I grew up on affordable housing, low income. I know the value that it brings to a community. Unfortunately, I do not have the same opinion as the previous speaker, parking will always be an issue, especially if there's only one parking assigned to a whole high school. So parking is a big, is already gonna be a big issue. The amount of the level of the building is too high. You guys are trying to fit this big, beautiful building into a space that just doesn't fit. It's not a good fit. I would love to see other options that we have but this space is just, it's, it doesn't work. And the building behind it, the, uh, what's it called, Capitola Garden, I don't know if you guys uh, are aware, there, there are some buildings that face right near that, the, the parking structure that this is gonna build. <coughs> you guys are not thinking of the residents that already live there. So I think this is a really bad idea. I don't think, you, I think this has been pushed through so fast and the residents here are not being notified. So I'm against this 100%. The last Zoom speaker is calling in from an 831-479 phone number. I'm allowing that person to speak. If you could please unmute yourself, you'll be able to make your comment. Hi, I think that, that number belongs to me. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, my name is Erin Bernal, and I am a resident of 42nd Avenue, and I'm calling in with concerns about the density of this project as well as the lack of parking that the developer is proposing. Um, my, my sentiments echo nearly every single one of the speakers we've had tonight with regard to not enough parking. Um, you could, we could have the meeting, the planning commission meeting on a walking tour of the neighborhood right now and you would not find one single place to park. And that is without this development being there. Um, having participated in the general plan advisory group, I want to uh, just discuss quickly the number of plans that are already earmarked <coughs> for the corridor between 41st Avenue and 45th the properties that have been identified as opportunity <coughs> sites for housing and mixed use development. And beyond that, the mall, which we all know is targeted for very large scale <coughs> density development. Project of this size at 44th and Capitola Road is too big. And I would encourage the planning commission to think about the long range plans for the city and 
thinking about quality of life. It's not only to the residents who already live here, but to the people who we are inviting to move in and become part of this community. When we are stuffing people into high, high density developments and not giving them a place to park, what kind of quality of life are we inviting people to experience here? It's not very good. Um, that concludes my comments <laughs> very much. Thank you very much, Erin. <coughs> Um, do we have anybody else? There are no other speakers on Zoom. Okay, do we have any other comments from the crowd? All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and close this public hearing and um, divert it back to the commission for discussion. Peter, you wanna start us Yeah, off? I can start this out. Um, I, I'll start with a question because it's, it's nice to hear Ed Bodorf come up and speak on this issue. And, and realize that I'm still on the same page with him on these kinds of issues. And the qu issue is bringing it to the city council, which I think is really where this thing belongs eventually. So my question to staff is, uh, s s after we rule here, there's an opportunity to appeal to the city council. And the question is, what is that process? Is that a, is that cost, you know, a fee? Uh, who has to do that? How, what would, what would that? Let's say we, let, we approve this and some member of the community would, would want to come forward and say, I object to this, I want to take it to the city council. Could you go over that process? We're gonna pull up the fee schedule. There's different um, avenues in which to do an appeal. Sean's pulling that up right now, but a member of the public can appeal a project and the language is included in the back of the agenda for this meeting regarding appeals by members of the public. Yeah, I guess it's the fee schedule that I'm kind of interested in. Because we, we could reject it and have the applicant appeal or we so could approve it and have the public appeal. If, if the applicant appeals, they pay the cost of the appeal. So the, the billable hours that staff puts into a project um, if it is appealed by a city official, there's no cost. Um, and appeals by others, so affected parties, is $562. So what was the first one again? The, if the applicant were to appeal, their cost is the, it, it's the cost of what our billable hours are okay. for the appeal. So if it were approved tonight and a member of the public appealed the project, it would be $562. If it were denied tonight and the um, um, But it could be approved tonight and a member of the Planning Commission could appeal it and it, that would be a no cost? It says appeal by city official, but you, oh, you, you can't appeal your official. own decision. <laughs> well, but you, well, so a city official would... So a city official... A city council member could... Um, could appeal it, but I, I would question whether or not they could vote on the appeal if they were the ones to call up the appeal. Interesting. So they they kind of lose their vote okay. by doing so. Layla, do you want to comment on this? Okay, thanks so much. Um, yes, yeah, a, a sitting city council member could appeal the Well, that clarifies my question here. Uh, in terms of my comments, I'd like to just first thank the members of the public for coming forward and bringing forward a lot of very thoughtful and informative comments. Um, when I looked at this proposal, I initially opposed it because it's a clear violation of the municipal code and the general plan and everything that we've been uh, chartered to enforce. But then we had a meeting with with staff and legal regarding the density bonus and how the state uh, supersedes our local ordinances. And uh, so I, you know, and in that meeting I pressed to see, well, you know, where, where are there exceptions? Where are they maybe exceeding even the state requirements? Where, you know, what kind of leverage we have? 
as Brian pointed out, uh, really we have to, uh, you know, uh, approach this thing in terms of health and safety, maybe environment. Um, but in terms of uh, things I looked at is like, well, the number of concessions, the, the state requires four concessions. I thought maybe these were in excess of four concessions and maybe so maybe that was a, an avenue. But, but then the waivers are unlimited, so that kind of kind of limits that. I, I think the notion of the safety of the intersection might be a reason to really uh, take a close look at this. That's why I asked earlier if the police or the public works made a formal statement on this. Uh, perhaps just relying on one uh, independent consultant uh, is especially based on all the concerns that the public brought up in terms of that safety, safety of the intersection. Maybe we shouldn't lean too heavily on that one consultant firm. Um, so there's an opportunity to object to this thing in terms of safety. Um, obviously the number of parking spaces is a, is, is a problem. Um, this even exceeds the state guidelines. If you look at the state requirements, they have a guidance of, well, well if you run the numbers, it'd be like 46 spaces, not, 30, not 36. So this even exceeds the state guidelines. Although even the state guidelines, as was pointed out by staff, are very soft and, and are told, you know, Basically, um, you know, you, you need to be very forgiving in terms of parking. So basically what I, when I looked at this thing and, and tried to push back and, and see where we could enforce our local ordinances, didn't get a whole lot of support from staff or legal, basically got the impression that any of our arguments could be easily challenged and overruled. And with that kind of input, I said, well, this is, this is something the city council has to take up. This is, I think our job is to look at the municipal code and now the state code and make interpretations of those codes and to the best of our ability and not challenge them or try to supersede them ourselves with our rulings. So that's, that's a job for the big boys as Ed Bauer, Bauer pointed out just a moment ago. Um, I, I do kind of, look at this and, and do see the positives. I mean, as everyone pointed out, there is a real need for affordable housing. Um, you know, a lot of people, a lot of the homeowners object, but I'm sure the new tenants and maybe some of the local renters who could get maybe a cheaper rent uh, would be uh, in favor of this. Um, all in all, there's, there's, some, there's some benefits here that, you know, we could look at the bright side and say, hey, this is three stories, not five. Um, it, is, it is a good location in terms of public transportation accessibility and amenities. So therefore the bike parking lot, you know, electric bikes, that kind of thing, maybe the parking won't be as bad as we all predict. Unlikely, but I mean, at least it's a decent location from that standpoint. Um, it's also near business and employment opportunity. So um, there could be a lot of people who work on 41st Street who would have uh, walking opportunities to walk to work, or bike to work. Um, I'm okay with the landscaping. I mean, we're fortunate that they've taken some, stri some strides to, to get the 40% canopy and have some decent landscaping attempts. Uh, they've worked with staff to, to follow as best they could um, our design guidelines in terms of the roof, si roof line and the, the facade and the massing, uh, the ma materials that varied. Um, so. All in all, I have to say that I think they've made reasonable attempts to, uh, to blend in with the community and provide um, affordable housing. Um, and again, I, I agree with all the, the applicants um, uh, and, and it could be worse. I would be, I don't think that we should continue this thing because I think we've heard basically the objections. I mean, we could hear a lot more people object to this project for a lot of reasons, but um, but basically we're gonna come up and as one gentleman said, we're, we're kind of railroaded, railroaded into approving this thing, whether we like it or not, because the state trumps the local authority. So uh, the people who can address this are the city council, if they want to, they want to fight the state. And that's why I would, uh, I would just as soon kick this upstairs and uh, was curious to know how to do that. Other than that, I, you know, this, I could say we could do worse on this project, and I, I, might, I have a tendency to kind of lean towards approval. 
but I'm willing to listen to everybody else's comments. <laughs> Um, yes, well, first of all, uh, staff, thank you for the report, and I, I definitely appreciate the public coming out. Um, my biggest concern is, as I've been in the community here now for 10 years, um, I'm a huge advocate for uh, community involvement, and um, I'd like to hear from the community, and so I appreciate everybody coming out. My concerns are with this size of project um, and hearing, you know, that people are just seeing a notice and everything would be that maybe we haven't heard from the whole community. And as much as I agree with you about it might ultimately end up being at a city council level decision, um, I think there's a lot of work that we probably have to go into this to understanding. And I think it's educating the whole process. And, um, you know, as a commissioner, maybe city council might find out uh, their hands are tied on a lot of these decisions. But I think it's an opportunity to learn. Um, we look at this as, I don't know the exact if this is the biggest project to come through in the last 10 years, but it is a very large project. And I think we're gonna set a practice going forward from here in educating our community on where our hands are tied and where they're not tied. And on some issues, we bring up the intersection as a safety issue. Um, you know, and that could be an issue that, you know, can be dis discussed at a city level. Um, it can be appealed, but I mean, it can be discussed. But um, educating the community about our elected officials above our city council right level um, has tied our hands, but I think there's a whole education process that needs to go into it. Um, and so I, you know, my feeling on it is that be continued uh, forward, but also that we look if there's, um, there's comments around questions that have been, uh, I've received multiple emails. I was out on the site multiple times. People ran into me when I'm out there on the site looking at it and bring up questions that if there's a way, a question and answer period so that we can help educate the whole community around this project. And you know, maybe at the end of the day, no one's exactly happy, but we can celebrate that we went through a process that everybody thought their voice was heard or at least were educated through the process. So if um, I would look at kind of continuing it as that a recommendation and then working through to, uh, the process of getting everybody informed. So if it did, got to, it did get to the city council level, that. We, the background work was done for them at that point, other than, you know, it's just starting all over and, you know, looking at gathering information at that point in time. So that's where I am with it. I, I'm concerned about the public notice. Um, I think there's some flexibility in the design for the height that we can maybe work together and figure out. Um, and then re-looking at, and I think you bring up a great, great point on, you know, having uh, PD uh, wage in on you know, and exactly if there's any safety issues or something like that, maybe you look at some statistics. I think some people have made some assumptions on how many incidents are there. Maybe we could really look at that and educate our community if there really are issues or are those just isolated instances. And then looking at, um, you know, if another traffic study would have to be done if there, you know, for a validation. So that's what my thoughts are on this project. Yeah, thanks, Jerry. I pretty much agree with everything that Jerry just said. I think <clears throat> I'm not worried about over-noticing. We've, like we talked about, we've done that before with big projects like this. This is a big one. This is also unusual with the uh, with the density law that I'm willing to bet 99.99 .99 or larger percent of the community has no understanding of, probably never heard of it. And I think we should send out a notice to a, a wider swath of people we should continue this, um, as Jerry was talking about. I think we should ask the applicant to reconsider uh, the height and the uh, daylight plane issue, the height in general. Um, maybe, I know you've given some thought to the driveway solution. Maybe there's something that we haven't thought about. And like I said earlier, some creative way to solve the parking problem, which I think the community is, um, you know, is bringing forward, you know, a few people have talked about it here, you know, we'll probably hear more from a larger crowd, but is there something we can do about parking? Because um, I, I, I'm not sure I, I would agree that it's a one-to-one -one ratio, even in the low-income community. I, I know you have some experience uh, with your uh, your project in San Diego, but I don't I don't know if that's generally true. Um, so I I think we just need to spend a little bit more time on this and and and. Commissioner Jensen's right. This does, is setting a bit of a precedent. We hope that there'll be more of these affordable uh, housing developments brought forward, and I think it's an opportunity for us all to learn about how they actually operate. <clears throat> so can I pull the thread on this? this? It seems like both of you are leaning towards continuance. Uh, 
I'm just trying to imagine what more we're going to learn. I mean, we'll get more community input. I, I think it'll be not expert opinion. It'll be more of what we heard. Um, uh, the, the thing I would want to continue it for <coughs> would be to get perhaps another safety study. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't any, know about any more density uh, discussions or parking discussions how I don't know what what we're, more we're going to learn there the only thing I can think of would be maybe a little bit more on the safety of that intersection because I think uh, Mr. Ruth brought up a good point uh, and, and certainly staff did that we have to worry about self health and safety of the community uh, but but I don't think we need to know well so if, if that was the specific recommendation to staff that we get an, an either another independent or have the police department weigh in or, or have more input on the safety of that intersection, I think I'd be okay with a continuance on that basis. I would echo your thoughts, Commissioner Wilk, and I'd also, I'd, I'd like to see more emphasis on the parking. Just, I'm sorry. I'd like to see more emphasis on the parking just to see how if there can be more measures, you know, pay attention to how they're going to deal with the parking on the street. And um, I mean, in terms of like maybe a getting, study, just or just you know, a well, you comparative mentioned getting study. the like external agreements with a, 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 another parking lot or something. Or yeah, or just <clears throat> other analysis, basically, and um, along with. Uh, Yeah, I, I agree. So a management plan for their parking or an, an something like that, some type of provision where it's not just um, going to exacerbate the existing problem. Um. Commissioner, if I, if I could just uh, seek a little clarification on the um, potential request for the what sounds like perhaps an additional traffic study um, for, for staff's benefit um, as well as my own. Could you elaborate a little bit more on what uh, would need to be included in that study beyond what has already been um, reviewed and assessed by the consultant? Well, Mike, could, what struck me is when one of the, I think it was Mick again, mentioned that like the, the the offset in terms of the driveway, so that you know when you have a four-way stop sign, you 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 have a tendency to make eye contact with the person across the way, and so that maybe the fact that this is a, is offset makes an unusual traffic condition. Um, you know, if there is precedent for this kind of thing that they could you could say uh, you know you mentioned Knob Hill, but that was shot down is not a very good argument um, where this driveway concept being offset uh, is, is not a traffic issue. Um, have, I just have another opinion. Someone study that intersection and, and, and look at whether or not an offset driveway, you don't even need to study it. You just need to look at the, the plans of that, of that offset driveway and have somebody who, who is a traffic expert or, or in public works who can say, that is common. It doesn't provide a safety problem. Therefore, you know, let's go forward. Or, yeah, that's really unusual, um, especially w uh, you know, in high traffic with all this, uh, you know, traffic equally coming all the different directions. You know, we've got we've, this is a real problem here. Um, I just don't think that, and I've you know, I've seen other consultants come in and 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 do come up with some crazy ideas. Um, so the notion of this particular that we're we're leaning making our decision on safety based on this one consultant's uh, input, I would just like a second opinion. So if that's the police department, if that's a separate study by uh, Public Works, um, I'd be okay with that. But I I think the the public has brought up enough concerns about that intersection that just this one consultant is, doesn't, isn't enough to convince me that we're okay. Absolutely, Commissioner. Thank you for that clarification. 
situation. Um, in situations like this, there are certainly going to be a lot of um, differing opinions on whether or not there's you know a safety issue here or a safety issue there. Um, one thing that um, I would just recommend is that uh, any any decision be based on uh, facts that can be uh, that can be supported by substantial evidence. Um, so rather than opinion or um, you know personal conjecture, um, as as much as we appreciate uh, public comment uh, on this, um, you know I did not hear a particular you know study referenced or. Um, any, anything of that nature, but that would just be something to keep in mind um, as the commission uh, continues to de deliberate. Well, we could, have, for example, get Kim Lee Horn as a consultant we always turn to all the time to look at this and say, do you agree with these other guys? And specifically address things like this offset driveway. Yeah, I think that's that's it. It's a non-aligned offset driveway. Is that, you know, is there is there any precedence for something like this? And, you know, what do the safety people say about that? It's offset by, you know, a good 15 feet-ish. Um, does that not give us, you know, enough meat on the bone, so to speak, in terms of facts? That That's a fact. That's how this site plan lines up. And by the way, you got, you've got roughly six cars per second going through that intersection from uh, west to east uh, between 4.30 and 5.30 every night. I actually call it the Capitola Raceway, but, um, you know, it, there's a lot of, the, the, the traffic volume is pretty high. Okay. So I think you, uh, somebody who knows in, uh, safety, uh, vehicle safety, uh, I think ought to look at this, not just a traffic management consultant, if that's possible. <clears throat> Thanks, Commissioner. Yeah, I, I don't pretend to be a traffic expert, but um, I would probably defer to staff on um, whether, you know, they, uh, on the, the depth and breadth of the uh, traffic study that was done. Um, I know that staff has evaluated the project and, and kind of has made their recommendation based on that. Um, but again, I would defer to staff as to, um, you know, what, what, the, what the depth of the study was done and exactly what it looked at. So Brian and Kate, yeah, I kind of understand what we're looking for. Yeah, I, I, I guess I would just restate what I what I already did say is that the the intersection is realigned to accommodate the new driveway. So there was thought given to that. I, I don't think that the consultant uh, dedicated an entire paragraph to that, but it was more in the the recommendations to modify the design that they gave to the applicant. The applicant responded by moving that driveway over and then showing the median moving over 10 feet. So, I mean, this was part of the discussion. It was part of the response to the discussion that the applicant provided, but uh, if, if the core- Maybe bring up a picture of the intersection again so that we can- it, If the core comment here is to get a second opinion, yeah, you know, we don't have that. But was the, the alignment considered Say yes, it was. So the width of the crosswalk is about 10 feet. Uh, I traced in what the existing median is, so it, it moves west 10 feet. This alignment here was moved east uh, at the consultant's recommendation. So it's shown in its final configuration. That's what, that's what we have, yes. So that does not align with the street across the way, right? That was mixed concern. Right. So the, the question then, is that a public safety issue significant enough to deny this application? And we have one consultant that says it's not a problem and I think we're looking for something else. <laughs> we want more verification of that. Police department, public works, okay. Emily Horn, somebody. Is that right? I mean, I'm out of I'm out of line here. I, I'm I, would, I would think it'd be a consultant from the standpoint of, you know, I think it'd be interesting to see that from the police response, um, if what instance and stuff like that, but to have a, another 
I don't. I think that's completely reasonable. I mean, I've attended. I mean, I came into this meeting willing to to approve this after after looking at all these things. I've listened to the public. I've seen their concern. I think they have. I think there's a lot of concerns we can't address, but that's one we can. So that's kind of it's kind of why. Yeah, I'm not. I wouldn't say the consultant said it wasn't a problem. I don't think they addressed the problem. They addressed the traffic volume and the queuing, and they addressed whether we need to put a stoplight there or not. They didn't say that that design would be unsafe, or did, they didn't say that it would be safe. In my opinion, I mean, it's a very good study. By the way, the inputs to the model were were arithmetically wrong, but I don't think that changes their conclusions. Um, but I think we do need somebody with some knowledge of safety to look at it, yeah. Okay, good. And that'll give us an opportunity. Now, so did you also want to increase the uh, noticing? Yes. Yeah, how, how far? I, I, <laughs> half a mile, I don't know. Something like that. I, you know, in the Monarch Cove Inn one, it was at least half a mile. Well, I don't know what we did for the when we talked about the hotel down in the I building. believe for the Monarch Cove Inn, um, we actually noticed all of Depot Hill yeah, because okay. it was the neighborhood and it's the one in and out. Um, typically when we've increased noticing, uh, right now it's at 300, I would suggest 500 feet radius and it goes from the, the exterior limit of the, um, the property, 500 feet. So you're gonna grab, our typical lots are 40 by 80. So it will get a larger. Okay. Well, that would be about seven houses. What's that? It'd be about seven properties in, right? But in a, in a circle around the property. So Correct. It's, right. um, I don't know exactly <clears throat> how many properties were noticed for. I could estimate approaching 300 were noticed already. So mm -hmm. it's going to increase that more than double. So I'm, just, I'm just concerned people saying they haven't seen it and you know if there's noticed only in the front, I don't know if that's true. I mean, it was only posted in the front, was it posted on the side? Um, if people say they didn't see it, didn't research, see the notice, I mean, we might, like to your discussion, you, we might just hear the same comment again, but again, everybody understanding the project, you know, I guess what, why I wouldn't want somebody to not understand what the project is and didn't have time to get input or know that they were hurt. So I think those two things are valid. All right, so here's, here's what I heard to, to parrot it back. So <clears throat> we want to flesh this out. If it does get, go to the city council, we want to give them as much information as possible and get as much notice as possible so that they're not stuck with having to do a lot of research on their own. So with, in that, it, it, in that spirit, we would want to continue this in order to get a better safety um, study in addition to get more noticing so we can get more public input so that if it does go to the city council, at least we'll, the public will have had a good chance to study this and comment on it. And then we'll also have a better safety study. And so then we can rule on that. And then, and then if it goes further, at least they'll have more information. So that's that'd be the rationale for it, asking for a continuance. Is that is that yeah. something? Commissioner, I'm sorry, Commissioner, if I could just add some clarification um, to the noticing. Um, there is a requirement um, that the commission, you know, with the project, as long as it was noticed uh, consistently with the code, um, which did require a 300 foot notice. Um, perhaps if the applicant would like to come up and, um, you know, discuss the potential for a greater notice, uh, that would be helpful for community outreach, as you were saying, and also ensuring that the safety of that, uh, that intersection is evaluated. Um, I think that would be very beneficial. Are we to, would you? Mm -hmm. Um, I guess my comment would be to increase the notice back to your comment. I'm sorry, I don't know your name, council, but uh, had to be based on facts. Um, it, it, is this public noticing, 
is that change something that's legally allowed to to increase that public notice? That would be one comment. And then the, the next one would be, um, is the traffic study asking for an additional study? Is that also based on a factor? Is that on the on an opinion that we don't believe the study that was done already previously? Those would be my comments. Is uh, what are those decisions based off of? So I'll leave it at that. So um, we can share the map of what was noticed. Sean, will you pull it up? And and I will say if. Occasionally there are notices that come back to us that have not been delivered, but it's maybe like a, a very small amount. But this, <coughs> what, what you're seeing in yellow is what was noticed. That's the 300 foot radius from the properties, the two properties. And if we were to increase that to 500 feet, that's what the green notice would be, the green line. So that, this is the, this is the tool we utilize and then it creates the mailing list, it's all connected to the county GIS and the tax assessor records and of who's living where. So um, so that, that those are the facts. Of the yellow is the 300 and that is where we noticed too. And if you wanted to increase to 500, I can also say that um, if you were to take action on this tonight um, for an up or down vote, you could also tell us, give us direction that if it were appealed, you'd like the appeal notice because it would get noticed on appeal to be the 500 feet. So just to offer that. But. So the rationale for the 500 feet would be because of this is a big project and uh, it affects the entire jewel box area and then some. And is that rationale enough to ask for additional 500? as a, over and above the 300 I mean we can ask for further further noticing right that's within our purview so I'm gonna uh, turn to our city attorney on that one because I'm just not sure with this type of application if we have the ability to ask for additional noticing beyond the code I, I know we've done that as a courtesy before for other applications but where this is state it's the density law bonus I, I I just, I'm unsure how to answer that one. I was having trouble with the mute button. Um, yeah, thank you, Katie, and thank you, Commissioner. So um, the municipal code does, uh, does indicate that the planning commission should uh, review and consider and act upon um, a, an application that complies, that was noticed in compliance with the municipal code. Um, and in this situation, it was required to be noticed at, 300, at a 300 foot radius um, for the purposes of the conditional use permit. I didn't follow but like Katie mentioned on appeal, that, that radius requirement increases to 500 feet. So, so are you saying are you saying then we're not we you we are not we do not have the authority to ask for increasing increasing the notice radius on a review of a conditional use permit yeah so like i said the the, the municipal code does require um action on the item um <coughs> you know, which can which can be a continuance um but you know so long as the um uh so long as the requirements of the code were met, that's kind of the, the, the limitation, the upper limitation, unless there's, you know, some willingness, uh, perhaps for him to, um, you know, reach out a little bit further, either for, you know, public um, outreach or, you know, understanding. So I'm still, I'm still unclear. The applicant is happy with the 300 feet. It's the, it's the commission who would like to expand it to 500 feet, and we do or do not have the, that authority to ask for that. The way that the code is written, um, there is not an authority to, to okay. requ or require an additional um, <clears throat> radius of noticing. But on appeal, they would have to notice to 500. Is that correct? Is that what I'm hearing? Yes, I don't have that specific provision in front of me, but I, that's what, that's, uh, I think, 
what Katie, you had, you had mentioned. Um, well, I, I, was, I was suggesting that if they were to take action tonight, that that's direction that they could give to us. But I, what I'm hearing is that they could give us that direction, but we would have to get the consent of yep. the applicant that to, to allow us to go to a greater extent. Because the, the code actually does say for appeal, it's 300 feet. My comment was that if they decided to make a, take action on an up or down uh, vote, we could consider increasing the radius and maybe the applicant would be um, a, allow us to do so, give consent. The, co the code for an appeal is 300 feet. It'd be an ask of the applicant. I'm sorry to keep going on this. Um, when, I'm just concerned about when, like Monarch Cove, for example, the city decided that they were gonna notice more and the applicant was fine with it. And so on this project, it was just a basic minimum that was met at 300 uh, because of more of a decision made that that 300 would probably be adequate at that time. And then on other projects, it was evaluated that it should be 500 feet or all of Depot Hill, is that correct? Yeah, I think under that one, we, we got direction and there must have been consent from the applicant that we could um, notice a greater amount of people, so. Okay. And I'm just looking for practice, you know, and, and what about when no, we were talking about like the hotel and the village? <clears throat> so typically we do the 300 feet. Like I said, I've uh, less than a half dozen times of, I, I think Monarch Coven was one, and then I think we did additional um, noticing during some zoning code update items that we knew. Um, I think it was like the vacation rental overlay. We went a little further out. Items that we really thought the community would be engaged in, but it wasn't, for that one, it wasn't really an application that they were looking at other than the city changing their own code. And then for Depot Hill, it was the entire neighborhood because of the in and out and the traffic. Thank you. Um, out of curiosity, how would we, I mean, as, um, Ed suggested kick it to city council. I, I believe that would be through a vote tonight, well, of a, an up or down vote, and then it could be appealed to the city council. You right. cannot um, just <coughs> suggest that, that because this, be, <laughs> this be heard by city council. You do need to take action on it before it would get to city council. Mm -hmm. Does anybody wanna make a motion? I'd like to make a motion to continue it going forward. We have one motion to continue. Mm -hmm. Uh, could I have a clarification on that? Are you having, uh, are, are there um, contingencies or grounds for that continuance? In, uh, yeah, in order? I would like to review the safety condition with the traffic, um, have that uh, evaluated, and then um, I would look at uh, ensuring that the 300 foot notice was noticed and that it was properly posted and so that the community that says they didn't know about it uh, we are well aware of it. So you would be directing staff to provide more safety information and then to justify their 300 feet? Correct, if we can't, if we can't reach out to the 500, I want to ensure. I just, I'm just responding to comments from the community. Motion. Here's a motion. So, Read back what the motion no, said. No, there needs to be a second. I'm reluctant to second it um, because I'm just not sure. I think the motion should be to continue this with the request that uh, staff provide more information on the safety of the project because that is an allowable re um, <clears throat> reason for rejecting the project, health and safety reasons, according to 65915. So I think so that the, was the his motion. The state gives us an out if we think that there is a safety issue. So we need to get the safety question answered. My opinion. Was that a second? So procedurally, we have a motion, and then are you seconding that motion? I am seconding it as long as we add some clause about a safety, an additional, or actually, it was not a safety review. It was a traffic review. Could we? we want a safety review of the intersection. Okay. Could we read what, what your the motion? Readback? Yeah, the readback of the motion. The motion I have on file from Commissioner Jensen is there's a motion to continue the item with direction to staff to provide a safety review for traffic relating to this project. Mm -hmm. And then originally you had requested that the 300 foot notice, it is ensured that it's properly distributed to residents. Is that no longer part of this motion? It's still part of it. 
Okay, so the motion is to continue the item with direction to staff to provide a safety review for traffic relating to the project and for staff to ensure that the 300 foot noticing requirement is accurately distributed to residents. Is there a second? I'll second that. Okay, <clears throat> a first and a second. Can we have a roll? Commissioner Esty? Aye. Commissioner Jensen? Aye. Commissioner Wilk? No. Vice Chair Christensen? Aye. Motion passes 3 1 with Chair Westman absent. Okay, thank you, <laughs> everybody. Um, all right, so number six is six is the director's report. Is thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, now we'll move on to the director's report. I have a quick slideshow for you this evening. Just I wanted to give you an update on the storm and the impacts to the city and. Um, uh, of course, our businesses and residents. So, I'm not sure why there's a security alert. It's not showing up on our screen to press anything. I think Sean's going to check the computer in the back. Yeah, can we give this to Julia? There were changes. Yeah. <coughs> Julie, if you can run it off your, yeah. Brian's printing it over a thumb drive. Hmm. Almost made it. <laughs> no. Oh. <laughs> oh, there we go. Yay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Well, uh, this is a staff update on the significant weather event. Next slide, please. Oh, is it Brian? Great. Okay, so the background is on January 4th, the emergency was declared and the evacuations in the, in the village. Um, on the 5th, around, I think it was 9 a.m., major damage was done throughout the village with, uh, due to the large waves and, um, and the, the rain, the atmospheric river. City Council on, fr on that Friday afternoon ratified an emergency declaration. Um, from there on out, I will say our staff on the 5th, we, uh, the Community Development Department went door to door. We brought in, we had um, inspectors come in from CSG, which is a contract service we utilize. We also had, um, through our Emergency Operations Center, we had two um, more inspectors, building inspectors, come over from the county. So with six inspectors, including our building official, they were able to go door to door through 200 to 250 different structures and put a placard on every structure between the hours of 1 and 9 p.m. So I was extremely just uh, so proud of our team and what we were able to accomplish. 
Um, <coughs> our, our group here was filling out placards. Um, Sean was also going out and putting when we knew areas that were definitely not affected by the water. <coughs> Sean and others in the department were putting those placards on buildings. We had finance writing out placards. So it was just a really good team effort and got out there and, and happy to report no injuries. Um, so after that, we spent a lot of time going through and just updating tags. There's the red, yellow, green system on each building. Green is you can occupy it. Yellow means um, you can go in, remove your things, and whatever the placard says, you need to follow the directions. And then red means it's too, it was too unsafe to even enter. We need to, to have a, um, a professional come in and check the safety of the building before it can be entered by anyone. On, as you know, another storm came through. On the 8th, we ordered a crane for the Stockton Bridge in fear of trees coming down the, um, the creek. On the 9th, we had a second evacuation of the village from 7 a.m. to 2 p.m. The shelter was opened at Jade Street. Uh, on the 10th, we had that visitor, uh, or we had Governor Newsom come visit and see the damage. FEMA visit to the village on the 14th, and then the President of the United States on the 19th. So pretty incredible 15 days with really sweeping impacts to our village. Next slide, please. Um, so what have we been doing in our different departments? So at the city manager's department, a lot of uh, social media getting the word out. So 13 media posts at this point, two newsletters, three press releases, multiple interviews and taking people through tours of the, the village and then three visits from government officials. They've also created a recovery webpage to provide resources and updates to the public. Next slide, please. Um, in, in terms of uh, finance and mutual aid, we've submitted initial damage estimates to the Santa Cruz County Office of Response, Recovery and Resilience. The initial estimates for city damages, this is not our residents and commercial damages, is 2.6 million. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a breakdown of the damaged infrastructure. Originally, the municipal wharf, we had budgeted 700,000 uh, 700, and, I'm sorry, 7 million, and now we're looking at possibly another million in repairs. Um, Riverview Pathway, 175,000. Cliff Drive, 400. The jetty, we need to rebuild some of those rocks. That was just rebuilt a couple years back. It's another 100,000. Stockton Bridge has had impact. And then Hooper's ramp and stairways. I just, for the municipal wharf for messaging, um, right before the holiday on December 23rd, we got the news that the federal government passed the budget and our wharf was fully funded to, to um, reconstruct and repair. So at this point, we're, we're now, we think we need another million dollars, but we're pretty close because we have seven million of funds that are um, <coughs> identified for the wharf. So now we're just about a million dollars short with that the over and storm. above the measure D? So we got additional money? Funds? So I think it was measure F where we got those funds okay. from. Yeah. yeah, measure F. And then there was um, money through the state that we received. So we were at about three and a half, and then we needed a, a matching grant through the federal government, and that passed on December 23rd. <laughs> so we're in good, we're in a much better position for this than we were a year ago to, to rebuild our wharf. So next slide, please. Um, this past weekend, there was we had to wait on volunteer efforts. Everyone, we kept getting calls, and we have a really long volunteer list. Uh, but because the weather continued to be bad and with the high tides. But this past Sunday, we were finally able to hold a Save Our Shores uh, beach cleanup day. And there's now, they created a path down to the water, which is safe. Um, we had to limit the attendance to manage crowds. So there was, you could sign up. And then once it was full of signups, that was, we put a limit to it. Next slide, please. Um, and then police, police contain, uh, they continue regular communications with business owners. They're continuing to maintain patrols of the impacted areas. Um, definitely been taking um, folks on tours through the village and being a main communicator in the whole emergency, participating with FEMA visits, and then they continue to attend the county EOC calls. Um, 
And for public works, it's continued cleanup of the waterways, potholes, addressing falling trees, um, coordinating with Cal OES, and then more recently, the fencing along Depot Hill due to landslides and erosion areas. And then in our department, community development, we've been providing at the direction of city council, no cost inspections and permits. We're doing expedited reviews. The building official, um, she's been amazing. She continues to work with the businesses and the residents and proactively going down to the village uh, on a daily basis to figure out gas, water, sewer, and, and, and inspections. I do wanna, um, We've got TJ Welch in the, our audience tonight. He's been very instrumental in uh, he and Robin working very closely together the, to get the PG&E back up and running to all of the customers within the Venetian and along the Esplanade. So thank you, TJ. Um, and then Robin, and actually TJ's been attending these too. We've been having a series of Zoom meetings on Monday, Wednesday, Fridays to impacted businesses, as well as uh, separate meetings for the Venetians just to, uh, give them updates as soon as we know them, and then also question and answer periods for those impacted. Next slide, please. And uh, so what happens here is the next question for planning commission. So when you're looking at the buildings along the Esplanade and you see the impacts, we're doing emergency. When Robin's out there, she's actually issuing emergency permits so that they can do work on site um, we'll be bringing those, we'll be bringing anything that needs a coastal development permit. It will be no charge to the um, businesses or the residents, but we'll be bringing those into you and it's probably gonna be in March and April that you're gonna start seeing um, like just bulk items for coastal development permits that we're allowed to issue the emergency permit, but we have so many, so much time before it has to be heard by the Planning Commission. So that's in your near future. Um, next door, you've seen our um, the small business um, administration set up a business recovery center. It's been amazing. All our, I've seen all the businesses that we know down in the village coming in and they can get money in a much more quicker than a, and at a lower rate um, to help them in the for the gap period until their insurance money comes through. So they were estimating two to three weeks in order to, to bring financing to them. So, and then we've also been involved with coordination on the um, regional level for disaster relief centers. So that's more for residents that have been impacted and that's the federal government coming in, working with FEMA and Cal OES and they've bring in any agency that you can think of at the federal and state level that may be able to help someone who's been affected. So the DMV has tables there for those people that a tree fell on their car. Um, the HCD is there, the housing and community development from the state to help those people in mobile home parks. So it's really, I went to the Watsonville one this weekend just to check it out. So there's one at Watsonville at Ramsey Park, as well as the Felton Branch Library. They're open from 9 a.m. till 7 p.m. every day, and they're a great resource to anyone that's been impacted. And that is my summary of what, what we've been up to for the past three weeks. So thank you. Thank you, Katie. <laughs> um, all right, now we're on to item seven, commissioner communications, ability. I just want to welcome the new commissioners. I know it's a trial by fire, man. This is, a, this is the toughest one you're going to have to go through. And I do have just one question. Um, would there be a way, and just a question, could we um, have a way at their next meeting on the questions that have been submitted? Is there a way that there can be maybe some response back to, or us, like in your report, maybe at the opening of the meeting, like we can kind of respond to some of the questions? I know it's, you know, at the setup, we don't really respond, but I think the community, if they have questions, just an answer back how we can identify that question and answer period, but just the responses to those? Sure, we can actually send a response and then forward that on to you so that you see the response to the public. So when other people in the community see, and I was just wondering, you know, so if a question gets asked, is there a way like at the beginning of the meeting, could we just run through what those questions were if they're not a ton of them, you know, so under, they understand that there was response. I mean, I think this is all positive, you know, looking sure. at it, but just that they know when they're getting, they're asking a question that there is a response back. Mm -hmm. is, that, is there a way that, that can, you can envision that working? 
Yeah, it, it, it all depends on when we get the questions in. So I think that, um, but we can definitely draft a response and for the next meeting for that one, we can attach it to the staff report as you know, what public comment we've had and have those responses. Because we do try to limit the back and forth between question and answers at the podium, so that makes sense. Yeah, okay. Thank you so much. And just one last thing, thank you to all you and your staff for what you guys did. I thought it was amazing looking at what everybody did with yeah. the response and inspections, everything. It, it was amazing to see everybody come together. So thank you. And welcome. That was <laughs> a really a quick, uh, the last hearing, the very fast hearing to have you come on board in that context. I apologize, but it's great to have you both here and looking forward to the next few years. Yep. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Okay. So with that, we're going to adjourn. That's good. All right. Thank you, everybody. Struggling. Oh, sorry there, Mick. What would you like to say? Well, the meeting's over. Oh, yeah. Just some quick ones. Some questions I think should be asked of the applicant for the affordable housing. Um, so I, because we've closed the public hearing, I think you could write this in, but it would be inappropriate for us to talk about the meeting. We, and we can't provide a back and forth right now. I'm not, I wasn't going to do a back and forth. Yes, I, I think it would I'm be, not going to ask a question. Okay. I'm just going to make a comment. I just, without the applicant in the room, I don't know. Okay. Sorry, Mick. The 300 foot rule, isn't that a minimum? Oh, yeah. It's, yeah, it's a minimum. The 300 foot rule isn't cast in stone. You can go beyond that. I forgot last time I was too embarrassed to ask.